Good evening, and thank you all for joining tonight's virtual discussion, Native Americans and African Americans, the process and progress of overcoming racism. My name is Adah Goodley, and I'm the director of the Lewis A. Berry Institute for Civil Rights and Justice here at the Southern University Law Center. And it is my extreme honor tonight to welcome you to the programming in honor of Native American History Month. We've partnered with Frontline PBS and Southern University Law Centers Native American Law and Policy Institute to have a virtual discussion around the civil rights cold case multimedia investigation unresolved. Tonight, we will review the case of Peter Francis, a tribal leader of the Masca, Passamasquoddy Indian tribe, excuse me, and the cases of Denver Smith and Leonard Brown, who were students at Southern University when they were killed by police. We here at Southern University Law Center are excited to partner with Frontline PBS on this project and to tell the stories of those who were taken by violence and hatred. For far too long, their stories have been buried beneath lies, cover-ups, and scandal. But tonight we get to see our work of investigating racially motivated murders come to light and come to life in a new way. For nearly 10 years, Southern University Law Center has partnered with the Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Project to uncover the truth and pursue justice in cases of racially motivated homicides. Through this project, law students have helped to locate and unite families with the truth of their loved ones. I was once a fellow of this project when I was in law school, and I had the honor to pursue justice on a path blazed by a civil rights giant, the late John Lewis. Through the Emmett Till Bill, funding and resources were finally made available to solve the cold cases that defined Jim Crow's bloody history. Although justice through the courts has been rare due to the passage of time, death of suspects and witnesses, erosion of evidence, justice through truth telling has opened our eyes and our minds to the power of reckoning. Tonight, we reckon with truths in two of the thousands of cases uncovered. And after tonight, we hope that you will explore more of the cases in the Unresolved Project. Here's a clip that will tell you a little bit more about the labor and love that went into this amazing project. Hi, my name is Damara Shigalu, and I'm a filmmaker and creative technologist. And I'm also the creative director of Auto Auto Pictures, which is a studio focusing on film and neo immersive media. We've been collaborating with Frontline on a really significant and socially relevant project called Unresolved. Unresolved is a multi-platform experience. It's composed of a podcast, a film, and I've been responsible for the interactive web experience and the traveling augmented reality installation. When designing this project, I was really inspired by looking at the role of the tree as a symbol in American history and the ability to design an experience that mixes art and technology with powerful investigative journalism to bring to life the stories of victims of racially motivated murders. Now here's a preview of Unresolved. All I can do is just hear my mama calling Jackson, Jackson, Jackson. I heard her got abducted and beat to death, and nobody has ever been tried for it. Mr. Speaker, the time has come. There are hundreds, maybe even thousands of these crimes that were never brought to justice. There are murders who have walked free for decades while the families of victims cried for justice. Passing this bill is the least we can do and we must do something to right these wrongs. When we think of family trees, we look at it as a connector between generations, but also there's the dark history of trees and the associations with racial terror in American history. And I wanted to kind of reclaim that to turn these into beautiful spaces. FBI, the Department of Justice, somebody knows something. Uh, in 
later years, you know, I ask questions about what happened. Because I wanted to allow audiences to participate in the memorializing of these individuals who lost their lives tragically. Roman Ducksworth Jr. By exploring the different chapters and the stories of these individuals, the audience member actually literally acts as a source of light to the experience. Often when we talk about the civil rights era or racially motivated murders, it feels like it's something from another time. I think that using technology to bring it to the now and also have it exist in a physical space is something really powerful. The way that I've designed the experience, you have to say the name of the person in order to be able to access their story. Herbert Lee and learn about their cases and hear from their next of kin. Very respectful. And the idea is that all 151 names are surrounding us. If people forget who we are as they have in the past, we'll remind you, because we are going to be here. We're always going to be here. I really truly believe in the depth of my soul that if we're going to have peace, if we're going to have healing, Everything must come out. We must tell the whole story, the complete story. Joining us this evening to discuss the cases of Peter Francis and Denver Smith and Leonard Brown, it's David Sickey. CEO of Siki Global Strategies, LLC, and former Kashata Tribal Leader. Also joining us is, I want to make sure I say this in the right order, Mr. Ed Pratt, who is a staple and a well-known journalist and advocate in Baton Rouge. Next, we have Michael Rusco, Associate Professor and also senior fellow of the Native American Law and Policy Institute at Southern University Law Center. Also joining us, Yoruba Richin, who is a filmmaker of American Reckoning. And finally, we have Brad Lichtenstein, also a filmmaker of American Reckoning. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. I'd like to dive right in in the beginning uh, with Peter Francis, if we could, and then discuss some of the deeper issues affecting Native Americans still today. So I'm sure many people are aware and familiar with the Peter Francis case, but um, our audience might not know. So. If we could have a, a little bit about the Peter Francis case, um, talk a little bit about that uh, and why it's significant. And also, how unique are the circumstances surrounding Peter Francis's death? Well, we can begin with you, David. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you all so much for this uh, outstanding program. Um, uh, it, it during the opening of uh, the, this program, um, I jotted down a few notes that uh, that that stood out to me, um, and words and phrases that uh, Native Americans uh, have uh, have lived by for hundreds of years, um, especially since uh, first contact with uh, external influences, uh, racially motivated violence and murders um racial terror um the these terms and words are all too familiar um in indian country um and in the native american world ladies and gentlemen um indian country is a term that's uh um that's uh, appropriately appropriately used um and uh, so if you hear me refer to indian country uh that's a general term um describing native american communities and tribal nations across the united states so unfortunately, um, the story of Indian policy in the United States uh, is a story of just triumph and defeat. Um, 
And this, what I'm, what I'm attempting to do is trying to set the, uh, the backdrop um, and, and lay the groundwork in order to give you a better uh, uh, context as to how circumstances are as they exist today and how and the difficult challenges that Native American citizens face uh, even in even in 2021. So, uh, you know, since the founding of America, we've had just different federal Indian policies that were directed towards Native Americans uh, uh, here in here in America. Uh, we had, uh, for example, uh, the removal period when the gold rush um, uh, came about, and and also as a result of uh, the railroad coming into uh, the United States. Um, we had the reservation system. Um, uh, we had the, uh, after the Civil War, we had the uh, policy of assimilation um, uh, in order to make the Native Americans uh, more European. Um, then around 1887, ladies and gentlemen, we had the General Allotment Act, um, which, uh, which Native Americans had to surrender private property that was uh, uh, our common estate. Um, then fast forward to 1934 with the Indian Reorganization Act. Um, and that is actually, you know, you shift, you'll see a shift throughout the founding of this country of, of, of policy going forward, going backwards, suppressing and oppressing. Um, and, and the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934 was, uh, it, it, the, the U.S. moved towards more pol policy of uh, tolerance and respect. Um, but with the onset of World War II, um, Congress went into reversal mode, um, uh, which meant rapid assimilation through termination of Indian tribes in, in our ways of life. Um, and, uh, you know, again, the, the, the responsibility of Native Americans was transferred at that time to states. And I'm getting close to my closing summary here. Um, with the civil rights era, federal Indian policy again began to shift and uh, the federal government again decided to recognize tribes um, like it did before. Um, now we're in the era, the Native Americans today in America live in the era of self-determination. Um, and that continues in force to this day. But basically, ladies and gentlemen of this panel and of our audience tonight, what that means is that it paints a very vivid picture and it, it illuminates the fact that when you deny people their identity and do so consistently and with concerted effort, time and time again, generation after generation, ladies and gentlemen, they essentially become invisible. So fast forward to tonight's discussion about losing faith in the criminal justice system, losing faith, having no faith in the judicial system, having no hope in prosecutions or no prosecutions in this case. So again, we're speaking on a topic that Native Americans and indigenous peoples of this country are all too familiar with, um, unfortunately. So again, that takes us to this, this discussion about, um, about uh, Peter Francis. It's not surprising to a Native American, for the most part, in general, when you ask a Native American, how do you feel about that? Why, was no, why were there no prosecutions? Why was no one held accountable? A Native American will respond by saying, we're, we're very experienced in this throughout the course of our history since the first contact with the Europeans and external influences. So tonight I'm looking forward to discussing the subject matter at hand here. And I'll be willing to give my viewpoints as a former 18 year veteran of tribal government and a leader of my tribal nation and also from the uh, vantage point of a Native American citizen here in America, one of the most underrepresented and marginalized groups in the United States. Thank you. 
Very true. Thank you, Mr. Sicky. Michael, Truth and Reconciliation Commissions. They've attempted to grapple with some of the world's most heinous crimes against humanity, specifically violent crimes against people of color. Most recently in March of 2021, the state of Victoria announced the creation of the first commission of inquiry in Australia into the violent dispossession and genocide of Aboriginal people during colonization. It's the most successful because it offered amnesty in exchange for truth. Other models did less to help locate the bodies of the disappeared in Argentina and in Canada, but tell what success at their completion. I ask you, Michael, can there be success without justice? And what does justice look like if not through a court of law? Mute. I put my I put myself on mute so that I don't, don't get any background and I don't end up spoiling the fun for someone else. Um, thank you for having me. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to talk about these important issues. Um, if I may, I want to give a, a short background on particular the specifics of the Peter Francis case and then get into your question if I could. Um, I won't get into the specifics. There was a Pulitzer Prize nominated journalist who wrote a 29 part series on these events. So I'm not going to be able to get into in the space of this, you know, my part of this presentation into the details. But what essentially happened was there were five uh, white, this was 1965, there were five white um, hunters from Maine and they went, oh, they traveled to Massachusetts. And I don't exactly know why they ended up at, um, the Francis house, but they went there and at the front, the Francis, uh, um, Peter Francis's older brother was a politician in the, in the community. And somehow they ended up at his house. And there were also, um, girls ranging from in ages from like first or second grade, all the way to 17. They were studying for school in the next morning. Well, these guys show up at the house and they make no, uh, uh, bones about, what exactly they're there for. They're there for um, uh, booze and women. And um, so uh, they're trying, the, the uh, Indian men who's, who are, who, this is their house and they're on reservation land um, <clears throat> are trying to, uh, as you might consider app and try to avoid a direct confrontation and um, just move them in another direction, move them to another house, get them to go somewhere else away from these girls. And at some point, um, a, a, a physical altercation did break out and um, uh, Peter Francis was beaten to death. And uh, one of the children, one, a, a young boy was assaulted. Um, another one of the older um, men was um, severely beaten. And as a result, um, Nobody was, there was only one prosecution and that was, that prosecution returned a not guilty verdict to cheers um, from the gallery uh, within, uh, within I, I think it was in 45 minutes. Um, so, and the other, the other four men were never prosecuted. I mean, they came to that house to do violence and nothing happened. And I um, echo uh, Mr. Sickey's, uh, former Chairman Sickey's um, thoughts on that we're not, no, nobody, nobody's surprised. Um, um, you have long ongoing unresolved uh, matters in this country dealing with natives. Um, every, you know, you've got the Black Hills, you've got Leonard Peltier, you've got um, uh, the missing and murdered indigenous women. Uh, in, in two, for instance, in 2016, there were 5,700 reports of missing and missing women, missing and murdered indigenous women, and there were 91 prosecutions. I mean, this is not. And, and for those who think that we're using a, a, a as a jumping off point an incident that happened in 1965, make no mistake. This is a living issue, and you have the till the Emmett Till Act, and you also have. Um, 
um, some uh, amendments to the VAWA Act that are helping with this with with this um, uh, problem. But a lot of it is um, there's not enough law enforcement, and it's not an important enough issue to other people for, to to spend the money to put more law enforcement on the reservations. Now, the good news is that tribes are becoming more and more financially um, uh, capable, and they're able to do these things for themselves. I mean, that's really great. Um, but uh, there aren't the tribes that have had financial success for you know one reason or another. Those are not the um, the common story. There are a lot of tribes that don't have those kinds of resources. Um, so moving back, moving to your more to your specific question about can justice be had? Can justice, uh, if it can be had, what does it look like if it's not through a court? And I think your the last that last little phrase in your question was exactly right in that um, at some point when you're going back 65, 70, 80, well, how many years, um, justice can't be had. Not that not justice where you bring the perpetrators in and punish them and make whole the victims and they they were never made whole. Um, but I do believe in you know, a certain balance to life. And that in in that sense, you have the great grandson of um, Peter Francis is now a, a, a high powered attorney. And he brings these issues, he works to bring these issues um, uh, to make sure that the people that, that died and were injured and were and whose lives were changed. And like there were several suicides um, that resulted from the Peter Francis night for, of witnesses, you know, the, the the kids that were there, the other the other people who were assaulted, um, and he wants to make sure that those people didn't suffer for no reason. So there is a sense of justice in that um, we should we cannot forget these things. And the Passamacotti um, Passamacotti tribe does their best to you know and has a memorial. And um, we use that wound um, that we have to remember and to do what we can to, to, to make sure these things don't happen again. And that's the justice that I think we can have. Um, but you gotta, and, and you got to remember that every time you hear somebody talk about critical race theory and how, you know, or at least... I mean, the people from my perspective that see critical race theory is invaluable um, uh, an important part. It's an important part to this whole process we're talking about. Um, you cannot just sweep it under the rug. The only way you fix it is if you take it out, look at it, and face it. And um, there are a lot of people who don't want to do that. And those are the people that you have to... Um, I don't want. I don't know how to. I don't know how to phrase. This is what I struggle with. Um, <clears throat> how do you reach out to people and help them see the justice and injustice of a thing when they they're people that you fundamentally disagree with and that you um, that don't really want to see it. And in my mind, uh, the people that don't want to see it, you can't help. They, they just won't. Um, I will say one other thing, um, and I'll close on this point, is that you governments don't create justice. They create the possibility of justice. We, the people that inhabit the um, functions of government, we create justice or we let it slip through our fingers. And so you can have the best government in the world, but if you have people in positions of power, which we've had stark examples of for the last four or five years, you have people in positions of power that, that refuse to fulfill their duties in good faith in those positions, to seek justice, to, to follow due process, to um, see the people that they, the people surrounding them as, as not the other, but part of their community that they have to um, help and bring forward. If they don't see that way, if they see it as a game, a game system that they want to 
take control of the, of the mechanisms of government to subjugate people, that's what's going to happen. So we have to, as people who are committed to seeing justice done, we have to get it, we have to get involved. We have to stay involved. We have to fight to inhabit the places in government that matter so that when the time to act on behalf of justice rises, someone, you, me, someone is there to say, yes, that, 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 you know, this is what we're going to do. This is the right thing to do. And no, we don't all have to agree on everything. We don't have to agree on a lot of things, but there should be some minimum threshold about, you know, how we're going to govern ourselves, what are the processes that we're going to respect and what justice is that we all have to share or, you know, it's, it's going to, it's all going to deteriorate. So that's, that's where, that's where I'll leave it. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Um, you actually set me up for the perfect segue. Um, what you're saying, I think uh, we've all been hearing the same thing in African-American communities. And you talked about the possibility of justice. The government doesn't promise justice, but gives us the possibility of justice. And I think, you know, a recent example is last week where there was the possibility of justice and we didn't quite make it in the Kyle Rittenhouse uh, trial. Um, there's no question that uh, there are themes and issues that are really pervasive in both the Native American and the African American communities. So understanding these common threads can certainly give us a greater appreciation for the fortitude of both communities and communities of color across the country. So thank you for those remarks. Um, at this time, I would like to throw it to the next clip and then we will speak a little bit with Mr. Ed Pratt about Denver Smith and Leonard Brown. What's happening is that the people are arming themselves, but we have a mass meeting tonight, Friday, August 27, 1965, place, 9 St. Catherine, time 6.30 p.m., purpose, protest, Ku Klux Klan violence. He my body, but not my soul. Georgia is not in good condition. But as we have told them many a time, they can destroy a man, but they cannot destroy this movement. Didn't do a thing that made us more determined. We are more determined than ever that we're going to rid Natchez of all the races, the bigots, the Ku Klux Klan, and you're going to do your job as police officers and as mayor of our cities, uh, Elf. Now you figure out what Elf is. Yeah. See, this is all of the the Klan. Klan say they're going to bomb me, so I'm going to stay here, man, and do whatever I can for freedom. And if I had to die for it, man. After George Metcalf, his car bomb, enter James Jackson, who is the cool street dude, dark glasses. Hey, man. Tall, dark, and handsome. Who's your favorite movie star? Hey, baby. Marlon Brando. James Jackson was a local barber. Very charismatic, always with his gun to his side. The community is angry. The whole idea of nonviolence is out the window. The quickest way to freedom is to meet violence with violence. Violence with violence. Black man. This is a powder keg, man. And tonight, tonight, the fuse is going to be lit. So on the day after that bomb explosion of George, they formed the Deacon for Defense and Justice. For the protection of our Negro citizens against the Klu Klux Klan racist group, in the Negro area. Rule one, do not attack first at any time. When action takes place, you must try and all also respect not to murder anyone unless it is in self-defense. The first Deacon's chapter actually begins in Louisiana. 14 people got together and they decided that they would arm themselves. It's because the police 
could not be relied upon to protect black people. And so black people had to protect themselves. They got national attention. Here in Natchez, five young men made a trip to Bogalusa, Louisiana. They had heard about the Dickens. We got there about maybe about one o'clock that night. They sent us down a back road to find them. James Jackson, he got out of the car and went with them. They gave us guns, and then we came on back here. The real reason for this is not to, to stir up trouble, not to start trouble, it's to prevent us. You understand prevent. that, right? This is another thing. You know the real stuff we're finna take, right? Get out now because once again, no, there ain't no time. out, see? Now it's the time right now. Days out there with you. Huh? Who? How y'all doing? How you doing? Where you with? I work at Armstrong. And where you live? What section of town you live in? I live out North Union. North Union? Yeah. So we might make your house communi communication house. We got to ask some communication home, you know, resident. So <clears throat> we like for you to attend our meeting uh, uh, in the night yeah. that you're off. Yeah. You understand? So we just trying to get the group. My father was a person that if, if he was emotional, you didn't know it. I never knew that he was in that much danger. Well, who want to be first man? Left hand, both knees on the floor. Good. Repeat after me. I do. I do. Solemn swear. Solemn swear. Up on. Up on. My own free will. My own free will. Up the end. Up the end. The end. The end. Of my life. Of my life. Repeat your name. Willis Jackson. Willis Jackson. Yeah. I do. Solemn. Solemn. Swear. Swear. Upon. Upon. My own free will. My own free will. According. According. That I will not. That I will not. Reveal. Reveal. Or invade. Invade. This is your America. Yeah. Yeah. Here to tell us a little about the clip we just watched is director Brad Lichtenstein and Yoruba Richin of American Reckoning. Oh, you're muted. Sorry, 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 sorry. Um, Yoruba, do you want to kick us off or you want me to? Go ahead, Brad. Um, so the scene you saw was um, Willis Jackson, who is the main protagonist in our film, being sworn in as a member of the Deacons for Defense, which was a black armed um, group that was protecting protesters, that was um, uh, you know, protecting people who were out doing a boycott against the white power structure in Natchez. And ultimately, Willis Jackson would be killed. Uh, by Klan members, a sub subset of the Klan called the Silver Dollar Group. Um, so in our film, we sort of go back in time. We start with the funeral of Willis Jackson, which came at the end of a long string of violence. And then we go back to 1965 to show how he helped to start up the NAACP and ultimately became a member of and supported the Deacons for Defense. And we focus a lot of our story on um, on uh, um, the effort to uh, fight white violence. Um, and to, as Yoruba said, you know, tell a story that a lot of people don't know about the civil rights movement. that really features a, a foot soldier in the civil rights movement who was operating, um, you know, in Natchez, Mississippi, where there weren't bright lights focusing on what was going on there. Yeah, and you know, what, uh, Michael said about, you know, the unsurprisingness of not finding justice uh, for this murder, which is what happened. Um, and uh, the family, you know, is still reeling from the murder and from the unsolved, how this murder was never solved, um, really resonates, obviously, for the African American community. And um, we still see it today, you know, we see glimmers of justice here and there, but overall, we see how the justice continue, justice system continues to, to fail us as people of color. And uh, as critical race theory, uh, to bring it up again, uh, teaches us that it's systemic, right? This is how the system was designed to be. 
Um, and we see that in these cases uh, from yesterday and, and from today. And um, I also just wanted to add that um, you talked about, you know, the government can't provide justice. It has to be the community um, that, that does it. It can set up the, the wheels for it. And I think that's absolutely correct. Um, and that we also have to look beyond the justice system, uh, beyond just putting someone in jail, because these are case in you know these are cases that are many many years old. The people who perpetrated them have died. Uh, but what is what would justice look like? And it's something that we really have to to reckon with. I think um, you know whether we look at reparations, um, which you know is should definitely be looked at. For these crimes and before the before the crimes that have been committed against people of color in this country, uh, but also too, we believe that part of the justice, um, you know, a little part of it is telling the whole story, telling the getting it out there. Um, the cold case initiative, uh, led by uh, Paula Johnson at Syracuse University, that's who d dug deep into this case of Warless and his family, um, not just his Warless who was killed, but his wife who uh, you know, was also an activist and also was obviously deeply affected by this murder, but telling the story of these people so they're not forgotten, who they were, um, who their families were, what they meant to the, the community. Um, that's a little part of the, and setting the record straight um, as much as possible. Can I make a friendly amendment? Sure, go ahead. Um, I, I, and listen, you talk. You mentioned the community has to has to do justice, and while I agree with that sentiment, I worry that it detaches um, the need for each individual. You know, when we can say the community has to do it, we don't have to do it. And the reality is, is that people, you know, it's 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 going to be tough for each of us to take little stands every day to bring about the kind of change that we need to bring about. And, but that's, that's what needs to happen. It even needs to happen. One of the things that I've been shocked about over the last five years was, you know, I had probably a rose colored impression of how far I thought we'd gotten with civil rights. I mean, I had no illusions about us being where we needed to be, but I thought we'd gotten a lot farther than we had evidently. And, um, then, quite honestly, the last um, administration just it, it 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 made people bolder. These people, you know, it, it tore the thin veneer off of it. And um, you know, I think that the only way that that veneer gets put back and thickened is mm -hmm. not leaving it to other people. We have to take personal responsibility and and commit to make our own community and our own world better. Sorry, amendment closed. No, thank you about that. And this next uh, case we're talking about, Denver Smith and Leonard Brown, really I think shows uh, students taking the onus upon themselves on the individual and on the community level to speak up about injustice. And in that happening, another injustice unfolds. And this is a story that we could see scrolling our news feed today or tomorrow. It's a, so familiar, it requires a caption, right? The students who were killed on, on Southern's campus. And while many know this story or are familiar with this story, I don't think we all have the details and insight that Mr. Ed Pratt has. And so at this time, I'm gonna ask Mr. Pratt to take us back to 1972, about five years after Mr. Jackson was killed in Natchez, you were a student of Southern University on campus that day. Tell us what happened. Well, um, it, it was mid, it was late morning and um, I was in the union. A bunch of students were in the union, but they had folks that were in the back of the campus. We knew people were back there. And my first intention, I was just going to sit with my friends in the union. And a guy came in, and all I know, his nickname was Sababu. And he wore a military helmet. And he came in, and there was a song on the jukebox, Daddy's Home. 
and I think that's by Randy, by one of the Jacksons. And he pulled the, the plug out of the thing and he said, y'all got to go to the back of the campus. We need everybody's support. Well, leading up to that, days and days before, students had decided we needed more state aid. We needed more equipment on campus. We needed uh, more uh, of everything uh, to complete the learning process at the school. We needed more courses uh, in, in extreme, and also courses in black history, all these other things. So one day the uh, students went on the football field and stopped a football game. Now, if, you, if you're trying to stop a football game at, at Southern University, that's about the dumbest thing you could do. But these students, these students wanted to make it known we need a change here at the university. And they went out, on, they went out and, and sat down on the football field and stopped the football game. Nobody was shot. Sub University uh, police and came in and they quietly moved the students off the football field after a while. Nothing happened, nothing violent happened. Students marched around the campus and they would have meetings in the, uh, the gymnasium, talking to uh, st uh, student leaders would be talking, Fred Prejean and others who was, who was the, the, one of the main leaders on that. And they would talk to the president and they would have big meetings, but nothing would happen. On the morning of uh, November 16th, that changed. The students came into the administration building where the president was, G. Leon Netterville. They came in there, they were not violent. They just walked in and went to see him. But the numbers grew and the numbers grew behind the, grew at the back of the campus where the administration building was. And finally, um, Netterville gets a call from the governor, little known from us, or he called the governor, whatever. And he walked out, got in a car, and left. Earlier that night, the leaders of the protest had been arrested. So they were not even on campus. The main leaders had been arrested, all right, at their homes. So what you had was a couple leaders, but not the main leaders there. But there were hundreds of students at the back of the campus because the feeling was it didn't matter. We didn't have to have a leader. We just wanted to make we wanted to make it known we wanted to change. There was no violence. There was nobody threatening anyone. But on the campus, there were state police and there were sheriff's deputies. And the sheriff's deputies, they had rifles and all this sort of stuff. And the the idea was, or so they said was they were just there for the protection of the administration. Well, the administration for all practical purposes, the president was gone. And so they faced the students. And there were students that were about 50, 75 feet away. And all they were doing is just yelling at, at folk, you know, telling people what they wanted. And we all just, I was not a part of that group. I was, I was to the side of where this group was, me and some other uh, friends. Then all of a sudden they, they rolled tear gas at the students, at a group of students. The students rolled the tear gas back and then all hell broke loose. And the word was they were supposed to be shooting blanks. They were just sort of, they weren't supposed to be armed at that time. Well, somehow two students fell down to the ground. They were both shot in the head, Demis Smith and Leonard Brown, who had nothing really to do with this other than standing around watching. They were not part of the leadership. They were just numbers. If you have a crowd of 100 people and you got six people who are leaders, these guys were number 98 not 99. All right. They had really nothing to do with it other than they, uh, as my grandmother said, they swelled the numbers and, uh, and, and, and made it look like, you know, a lot of people were involved in this. But all, but all hell broke loose. It stunned us. Because the first thing we thought, they could not be shot. They must have gotten trampled when people started to run. And so nobody, but a lot of students didn't run because they just didn't believe anybody was shot. And this young lady started to scream. And that's when we knew these young men had been shot. And that's when 
the law enforcement just turned on everybody, shooting all kind of things. But what happened was it left that damaged students because in the days following that, there was absolutely nothing done. It broke my heart. I was this 18 year old student. I had never seen anything like this. And the group around me, we were just stunned. And all day long after we left campus, we were stunned. But we knew, we felt it, that somebody was going to be arrested for this. These, these students had nothing. Well, the sheriff's office came out the next day or so and said there were students that had weapons in the administration building. Not true. Well, if they didn't have shotguns for sure. So then another story had to be told. And they came up with a couple stories. Only story that was true was somebody shot them from where the, uh, the sheriff's deputies were. Somebody did it. There was supposedly an inquiry into this. They knew who did it. How do you accidentally shoot blanks and shoot two people in the head? How do you accidentally do that? You had to aim to do that. You don't accidentally shoot people in the head. If you're just trying to wound, you hit them in the leg, you hit them. But they shot two people in the head. They said, oh, it was one buckshot. One uh, uh, shotgun shell killed both of them. Maybe, maybe not. But somebody did it. Nothing happened to them. And it's like, you know, you that's, that was 49 years ago. And I think of it just like it was yesterday. And all the students wanted, and the black community in Baton Rouge wanted, the black community in the state wanted, was tell us, you know who did it, that they're go you're going to arrest them. Somebody's going to do something about it. The governor did nothing. The None of the legislators did anything. None of law enforcement. All they said, that we investigated, we just, we just, it's just too hard to tell. It was part of the thing that they threw up the, the, blue, the blue shield, the blue line. We're not telling on each other. It's the same thing they, they claim criminals do. They don't tell. Well, they didn't tell. And over the past 49 years, even when I was a student at Southern, I wrote, I was, on the, I was on the school newspaper. I have written probably 15 or 20 uh, columns saying each time it's something different, but the, the, everything comes down to the same result. Nobody was ever, nothing was ever done. It was like they said, oh, well, Nothing happened here. Well, let's, let's move on. And that's one of the things that has damaged the black community and the Native American community forever. We don't yes. care enough to do anything. If it, yes. if it, if it deals with us, we're not going to care. And there's just so many people who feel just like, like I do, that we mm -hmm. lost two young men that didn't have to die. Mr. Pratt, and maybe other people on the panel, you, you may have experienced this, but I know our grandparents used to say, don't stir that stuff up. That's, that's in the past, it's old. There was a justice there, don't bring that back up. It was like, it was a shared belief that ugly history is better off buried. So how yes. learning about these injustices help us heal? Well, I, I have made sure I worked at Southern for, for seven years myself I, as a PR person. I made sure that message continued. The university has named uh, its union the Smith Brown Memorial Union. But you know that's great, and I and I and I I'm for that. But I agree with the university as it goes about its business telling the story. It gets the story back out there all the time. And I tell the story in a newspaper, wherever I can, I keep the story going. And I think that, and I put that in the last column I wrote a uh, week before last, that that should be part of freshman. We had a thing called freshman orientation when I, when I came to Southern. You learn the history of the university. They give you all this stuff. That should be part of every student that comes on that campus. They get that story. You know, you get that story, your, your first day, second day, third day, you get the story. And you understand why that union is, has that name and why those pictures of those two young men are there. But I said, Ma, I can't let that go. I saw two people get killed and nobody, well, I can't say nobody, we cared. 
but nobody in government, nobody in influence gave a damn. And they just walked away from it. Oh, that's just part of the game. Mm -hmm. I'd like to uh, bring what Brad into the conversation at this point. And either of you can answer this question. Why is it important to tell these stories? And if you don't mind, please go into also, why did you make this documentary? Well, I'll start with why it's important to tell these stories. Um, you know, I feel like I'm on a one woman mission to <laughs> get these stories uh, out and uh, to understand, to help us understand, you know, everything about why we are in the positions we are in today as African Americans from economically, uh, the justice system, the, the criminal justice system, mass incarceration, um, to our own like psychologies around, uh, you know, around uh, our history and how we've been treated. Um, I think you're absolutely right. There's been something in our community um, that has said, you know, don't talk about it, um, you know, even in terms of slavery and understanding uh, the history of slavery, how it's impacted us, uh, massacres that have happened in this country um, that have, you know, uh, uh, driven black people out of, you know, th that have destroyed black communities, um, driven people out of, out of uh, uh, the, you know, certain towns and cities. I mean, all this is part of white terrorism that has been, you know, the basis of why we got here. And where uh, I think it's been unfortunate, I mean, I understand that there has been um, largely a community thing of not talking about it. Um, maybe it's a psychological, um, you know, defense, uh, but we have to we have to understand these stories and tell the stories so that we, it doesn't happen again. And also we can demand whatever justice needs to, uh, that we need to demand, whether it be as I, again, as I said, from reparations um, for, to, uh, uh, you know, crim um, to looking at the legal system, to a truth and reconciliation commission. I mean, we should be demanding and from our government, from the community, which is us agreed, uh, that these crimes against our community have to be acknowledged and reckoned with. And I would like to add to that, that it's also important to pierce the veil of white denial, that mm -hmm. for as long as white terror has existed in the basic founding of this country, there has been alongside it a powerful denial that will go to all kinds of extreme measures to um, to reinforce itself. And so one of the powerful reasons why um, I was attracted to making this film um, was, you know, its origin was actually in a story about reconciliation. Uh, I happened to have had a relationship with, with Mr. Lewis, with John Lewis, and he was in the process of, of um, uh, talking about a, a former Klan member who came to him asking for forgiveness. But the deeper we sort of looked at that, and the more I talked with his staff, uh, the more we started to point in the direction of the Till Act and, and these, um, you know, unsolved murders, which really point up the fact that you can't have reconciliation without justice, without truth. Um, so that was, that was the motivation. Um, and I think, you know, Yoruba and I express um, the, the reasons why this is an important story for multiple audiences and, and why all these stories are important for multiple audiences. I, if, if I, I think that's exactly right. Is it? And it go. It, you can draw this um, comparison to other concepts, even to um, Catholic. Uh, um, what's the, the confession? You cannot have forgiveness. You cannot have justice until you admit what you've done and you accept that it was wrong. I mean, there's there even things like there are. You know, I don't know if there there are classes or little YouTube videos on how to give a good apology. And one of it, one of the fundamental things you have to do is, I'm sorry for what I did. This is what I did. I'm sorry for what I did. This is how it affects you. This is why it was wrong. 
you have to own it until it, until it, before you can be forgiven for it or we can get justice for it. And I really I, I, I like what you guys are doing with the film. I think that's exactly why your work is so important. Um, so one thing I would add is that, and this is kind of my own kind of um, uh, windmill that I tilt at, is that I worry about casting or, or, or casting institutions as the villains in this thing. Like the same way that, that government can't provide justice, people can provide justice, provide the opportunity for justice. I don't think, in, I, don't, I think there are some institutions that are inherently prima facie bad. But conceptually, conceptually, um, the justice system should work. And I'm not saying it does. It doesn't. Why doesn't it? People. It's the people that inhabit it. The people are the are the villains here. Um, the people that won't, you know, that are in the position to do justice and don't. The people that know what the right thing to do is and don't. And that's, you know, I mean, there are lots of, you know, there are things that are probably institutional that we can point to, but I tend to see it as a failure of the human, the, 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 the human character. Like, um, you know, we all know, speaking as a lawyer, we all know that the, the, um, the criminal justice system, guilty until proven, uh, 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 innocent until proven guilty. That's the way it's supposed to run. But everybody who works in that system knows that it's the defense that has the uphill battle and not the, and not the prosecution. That's not about the conceptual framework should you know, all things being equal should work, but it doesn't. Why doesn't it work? People. I just have to push back very quickly looking at Ahmed Arbery and the law that they used to, um, you know, to justify their, uh, you know, justify killing him was a law that had been, you know, instituted in slavery times for, you know, for uh, capturing slaves. So. I mean, I hear what you're saying, but I think that we have to look. I think institutions are uh, part of the systemic problem uh, of why we haven't got justice, and that it is, you know, at policing, um, et cetera, and why we need incredible uh, reform <laughs> to address it Agreed. because the system has been rigged against people of color. And, and so, point taken about that law. That level well, right. but yeah. And to your point, um, I this past summer, we teamed up again with Frontline PBS and put on a number of events in Jackson, Mississippi for Juneteenth. And one of those events was a restorative justice circle that we had with descendants of lynching victims. And Denise Ford was one of those participants, uh, the daughter of Warless Jackson. And she said something to me that sticks with me to this day. And that was, she doesn't look to systems for justice because the justice system never gave her justice in her father's case. But when she mm -hmm. shows up into spaces like this, where we tell truth and have it acknowledged, that's when she feels a semblance of justice. That's when she feels mm -hmm. a semblance of healing happening for her. And so with that, I want to toss to the very last clip and thank Yoruba and Brad for your vision and for your passion for this project. I can tell it will be an important piece of American art and memory. Um, I can't thank you anymore for, for what you're doing and bringing these cases to life as a, you know, going from a student to where I am now and constantly having these cases and these families in my heart and these stories constantly at the forefront. Um, it is a breath of fresh air to see this work in this way. And I think that people will really appreciate what you've done. So thank you so much for that. And we will go to the last clip with that said. Thank you. Good morning. Hi, good morning. How are you doing? All right. Good to see you. Good to see Ms. Ford. How are you doing? I'm John Lewis. Hi, how are you doing? Good to see you. I gave up a lot of times in my life that no one would be brought to justice. But then someone comes along and gives you hope. I, I know what you have been through. 
some of us will not rest until we find closure, find some answers. Let me ask you a question. <laughs> what more, uh, you know, just for our case, we see after 50 years, a lot of these people are dead. Yeah. So how, how can we uh, bring well, closure? How can we, I mean, what, what can we do through this bill? Well, we need to, to continue to investigate because it could be family members or some of the people who committed these unbelievable acts of violence, still living, walking around every single day. They didn't say anything, they didn't do anything, or they looked the other way. I work right beside of a KK's, one of the KK members, mm -hmm. daughter-in-law. Mm -hmm. I'm quite sure that someone knows yeah. something. Yeah. And for them to not have come forth after all these years, mm -hmm. it's just, it's unbearable. Mm -hmm. Uh, to hang in there. I think they have to come forward. People who know something. Great. And we're going to check to see if there's any questions um, for Q&A. And while we check on that, I'd like to give everyone, all of our panelists, an opportunity to give closing remarks before we leave. We can begin with you, Mr. David Sicky. Okay, thank you so much. It's been a very enjoyable uh, program. And again, thank you for the opportunity to uh, give voice um, uh, to the, the discussion. The discussion, ladies and gentlemen, does not end here. Um, this is only the beginning. And the fact that we're able to openly have these discussions um, is uh, a testament to the fact that we're willing to to uh, find justice and to and to uh, bring peace to uh, the the families um, and also to put an end to injustices everywhere um, it's a step forward in my opinion and these types of dialogues discussions and exchanges should take place everywhere and i encourage everyone uh, to have these um, forums whether it be here uh, whether it be at churches, whether it be uh, in your homes, it does not matter. Uh, sometimes we have to look back in history and examine uh, unpleasant things and occurrences and incidences. Um, some things are awkward to discuss, um, but the fact that um, that we have come so far and have so much to do is is a reminder that we all have to work collectively to 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 address this problem of. Uh, racial violence and injustices and uh, and hatred and bigotry and so forth. Um, but ladies and gentlemen, I always like to point out the fact that one should use history to inform um, and, and not to imprison, um, that only by confronting the past can we inform the present. And uh, examining those cases where those innocent students were murdered on the campus it should be a teachable moment for everyone. It's an opportunity to use, to teach, and to prevent things like that from occurring in the future. Again, it's unpleasant, it's awkward, it's not fun to talk about, but we have to bring, like I said, truth to the surface and get the right facts out there. And, uh, and the, the Kashada tribe were, became the executive producers of two Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls documentaries. One was Somebody's Daughter, the other one was Say Her Name. And during the introduction uh, at the world premiere of Somebody's Daughter, which took place at the first ever Native American Presidential Forum in Sioux City, I, I said to the audience and in my statement and in my remarks, violence does not discriminate and neither should our laws. And I think that's a, entirely appropriate to this discussion and this dialogue uh, today and tonight and this evening. Thank you so much, Mr. Sicky, Professor Michael Rusco. Um, again, One thank minute. you for, um, for hosting this. Um, thank you, um, Brad, and, and I forget how to pronounce your, par your partner's first name. Yoruba. Yoruba. Brad, you and Yoruba are doing amazing work. All we need to have more of this, where you know people 
in our own community see us come together and see us talk and see and bring we bring these and i think when more of that happens and we're not afraid to talk about these things that you know makes the other side afraid and makes our people our families our children the people that watch us as 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 uh, role models um make gives them strength and um courage and um a sense of security that you know we're here we we're we know what can happen what has happened and we're gonna do our part to make sure it doesn't happen again thank you mr or professor rusco mr pratt final comments i just want to say thank you for in, including me in the, the incident at southern university and i say incident the murders at southern university uh the group here is amazing I, I feel blessed being part of it um but i only ask for i ask for two things one well a couple of things one that i don't cast a, a shadow on all law enforcement but the ones who are wrong they're wrong and that should be brought to light uh the other thing is i want the families of Leonard, Leonard Brown and Demba Smith, to have some closure. And so I hope and pray that next year, on November 16th, that I'm writing a, I'm, I'm still here, and I'm writing a column about somebody came forward and told, told on themselves or told on somebody else, and that we could put this thing to rest. Well, as far as we know who did it. That's my wish. Um, I would love to write that story. I would love to interview whoever it is that did that, or maybe the family member, somebody who knows this person may be gone. I mean, it was 49 years ago. That's my goal. I just want to write that story. I want to see the faces of the families who I met and, uh, and get this thing over with so I could feel good about, or feel better about what has happened. And and also, hopefully, the the tragedies that we see in the streets of America right now with our people, that, that's, that starts to subside. Thank you so much, Mr. Pratt. Brad, you have the honor of giving us our closing remarks. Close this <laughs> out, please. <laughs> that's too much pressure in the company of all these really amazing people. So thank you for, for including me. Um, and I'm sorry that Yoruba had to leave for another engagement. So I'll try to, I'll try to hold it for both of us. Uh, but I do see that one question bled through that actually kind of um, dovetails with what I would want to say, which is when courtroom justice is no longer available uh, for the people we talked about, what does justice truly look like? And, you know, we live in a very um, uh, imperfect society, or I'm Jewish, we always talk about how we have to repair the world and the world is always in need of repair. Um, and I mentioned John Lewis, uh, who I had the great fortune of meeting first and then working for when I was 15 and, and knowing, um, you know, for all my life, um, all his or last part of his life. And, um, you know, Mr. Lewis it was an, is, is an eternal optimist and um, has to be really to have done what he's done in his life. Um, but he also uh, was a pragmatist and he understood that what justice really would be in all of these cases and really in the broader sense um, is that uh, there would be reparations and there would be truth um, that would lead to reconciliation. And he even tried to start off with legislation that would go in that direction of a truth and reconciliation committee. Um, and he understood the limits of politics here in this country. And so the Till Act began really as a compromise. Um, but I think it's a step, and he would say that it's a step. Um, you know, he, he likes to say that he was arrested 40 times fighting the system during the civil rights movement. And in one of his last speeches he gave, he said, and I've been arrested five times as a member of Congress. And probably if I live longer, I will be arrested more, which I think we could have all counted on. Um, but I think what it always reminds me of is what Frederick Douglass said, which is that power concedes nothing without struggle, without a fight. And I'm paraphrasing. 
Um, and so when we talk about these individual cases, we also do have to recognize that all of us are operating within a system um, that is designed to, um, to bolster white power and white supremacy. And it takes um, a Herculean effort to be able to tear that system down and to rebuild it in the model of justice. Amen. Thank you for those remarks. Thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Please, please, please visit uh, Frontline PBS's website so that you can peruse the interactive um, web interactive documentary thing. It's an experience. It is unlike anything I've ever seen. It's so well done. It's so powerful. There's so many more cases that you can read about and learn about. So please, please um, check that out at your leisure. And thank you so much again for joining us this evening. Please have a good night. Thank you.